live action. Live Oh, anyway. Cheers, Tim. Anyway, welcome to 2022. I'm Stu from Newcastle Brew Shop, and this is my learned friend, Andrew, who you've probably also seen in the shop, commonly known as Stas Brewing on YouTube. I am enjoying a uh, nice American pale ale from my G40 that I brewed late last year, kindly nice. donated by uh, grandfather. What are you on there, Andrew? I am on a Saison that I brewed for Christmas, also brewed on the G40. Um, it's come up nice and clear. It's got coriander seeds and orange zest, um, pills and malt, a little bit of flake maize and aurora malt or melanoidin malt that I had lying around. Nice, nice. I can't even remember what was in this. The guys at Grandfather sent it to me, so I brewed it. it tastes pretty good. I'm happy. So... The idea of today, guys, is we're going to talk a little bit about temperature control um, so that we're able to brew our beers all year round and, and different styles of beers and what temperatures they're best brewed at and, and maybe just a touch on yeasts and, and which ones prefer colder temps and what have you. Um, ways of temperature control. Um, and then we're going to move on to chatting about the Brew Father app. Um, we use brew father at the shop. Um, I use brew father when I'm brewing, talking to my grandfather. Um, I've got the app on my phone to control my grandfather if I wish. Andrew, you use it as well, obviously. So, yep. hey guys, down there in the comments, just chuck a comment in. You're a new brewer, um, you're a grain brewer, you're an extract brewer, just so that we've got a bit of an idea of our audience. And if you do have any questions, chuck them in the comments. And Andrew and myself um, will have a crack at answering them. Before we get right into this, I want to show you this little bit of kit that I've got. Ah! Hey. Once I bought myself a brew shop, I can buy little bits of kit. So this is the Fermenter King from Keg King. You may have seen in the shop the stub nose and the Fermentosaurus fermenters. Um, that's all I use at home. Yeah. I just have one sitting in a fridge, which I temperature control with my ink bird. But the idea of this little unit is, and it's seriously, like that's, you can see me holding up, that's my hand. It's like as big as a shoebox. It's a little miniature glycol chiller. So up the top here, it's got a little STC um, 1000 um, temperature controller. A couple of liquid post outlets, and this is a reservoir for glycol and water mix. We can do a little 500 mil of glycol. You put roughly a couple of hundred mils of water, 50 mils of glycol mixed up, and you connect it via some hoses and just basic all keg disconnects. If you can imagine this part here sitting inside my Fermentosaurus, it's not the easiest thing to see. I then get this bad boy, which is a stainless steel coil. Attach that to my lid, which are, they're not pre-drilled, but they're marked out on the new stub nose Apollo lids. I can then use glycol to chill my beard. Why do I want to use glycol to chill my beer? Because when I'm away camping, I don't want to drill holes in my $1,000 75-litre fridge. I've got this little bad boy running on 12 volt because if you do that, you can plug it into a little 12 volt unit which runs off your car. You've got the small chubby plastic fermenter that's available, that's made out of the same PET. Um, it's almost like a, uh, a disposable keg if you wish. It is cold, <coughs> no fridge. Put it in a, there's a, an insulation bag that we can get and you have got cold beer on the run 24 seven. Now, I saw this thing in operation off the guys at Keg King when they came into the shop just before Christmas and 
this chilled down to minus four degrees in ambient temperature, like in 10 minutes. So it works really, really efficiently. I'm going to have a play with it over the next month or so, um, and I'll make some more videos on how it works. But if you don't have room for a second fridge, or you don't want to get into a second fridge, this might be something worth considering for your temperature control. About 300 bucks, 350 bucks. So it's pretty affordable. Um, so that's the Thermeter King. So stand by for some more info on that. What's a couple of the most important things about brewing? Oh, well, I always say that there's, there's four things. Starting with the good, well, actually, no, the last one's good quality ingredients and recipe. Which you always find at the Newcastle Brew Shop. Yep. Everything cleaning and sanitised. The cleaning and sanitation is most important. Next is temperature control. And if you're going to choose where somewhere to pay uh, attention to, fermentation. The cold, the cold side, where your fermentation happens, that's where you want the tightest control on your temperature. Because if you let it run away and get too hot, you can get all these sort of uh, fusel alcohols, nasty um, flavours in your final beer. If it's too cold, you end up with some, you can end up with off flavours. You can end up with a stalled fermentation. So temperature control of your fermentation, super duper important. The next one, number three, cleaning and sanitation. <laughs> it's that important. Two separate things. You can't <laughs> yep. sanitise something that isn't clean. That's right. That's right. It's got to be visually clean. If, if it's like looks nearly close enough and you're just going to sanitise over the top, you're not actually going to get underneath that organic matter and you'll end up with not very good tasting beer. So, yeah. But in all honesty, cleaning and sanitation and temperature control. As a brewer, you're going to spend 70% of your time cleaning and sanitising. Yeah. Yeah, we get people coming to the shop all the time. They're dropping all this time and money into a beautiful looking kegerator with three kegs and a grandfather and all the kit. And when they brew it, it doesn't matter if you're brewing in a plastic fermenter or not. I use plastic fermenters. I use a fermenter saw. So there's nothing in that I brew in that's stainless. Um, and all I have is a fridge. Yes, okay. It's an old series <coughs> four kegerator that I have. I plug in my inkbird temperature controller. So you can see on there, you can set it. If I increase the temp to that, just for shits and giggles, and press set again, this heat belt is going to kick in the gear. So that's started heating there already. And I can feel that heat belt warming up straight away right now. If I had my fridge here and I plugged my fridge in to the other side for the cooling side, set my temp down nice and low. The shits and giggles, we've gone to four degrees, let's say. Press set. Heat belt is off. Fridge is on. That's going to click to cooling. Well, it won't click to cooling mode here because there's no fridge plugged in. But it will set to cooling mode and it will turn your fridge on and cool your beer down. 70 bucks. Heat belt's 30 bucks. 100 bucks. You're brewing all year round. Good as yeah. gold. It's worth noting that you're actually wanting to control the temperature of the wort. Yeah. And not so just having it dangling in the fridge, that's yeah. not good enough because air is a terrible conductor of heat. Um, and so you might have, if it's if your fridge is sitting at 22 degrees or 18 degrees, your fermenting wort might actually be at 23 degrees or 25 degrees and you won't, you won't really know. So taping it to the side of the fermenter, you don't need a fancy thermo well. Of course, if you've got one, you'll have even better control. Um, but just taping it to the side, insulating it, um, you'll find that when you look at the beer, you might go in a bit warm and the temperature will fluctuate as the fridge, as the, as the ink bird tries to cool the beer and then it overshoots and then heats it up. But after about 12 hours, it would be rock solid the entire time and yeah. you'll get consistent results. doesn't matter what the temperature is doing outside. It just takes all the stress and hassle out of um, out of brewing. So, um, If you can't do that, can't afford that, go to Bunnings, grab the big plastic laundry tub, 
Um, I have gone to the couple from the laundry downstairs, much to my wife's disgust when I first started. Throw a bit of water in there, throw some ice mix in there, chuck your fermenter in there with your beer in it, and it just helps to regulate the temp, yeah? It's not going to go yeah. 30 degrees in the middle of the day and then 20 degrees at night time, and then you're going to get all these horrible flavors. It just helps to regulate it. Not the yeah. best thing, but if you're a bit short on cash or room or space or whatever, 10 bucks and you get a big plastic bucket, Robert's your dad's brother, you're away. Yeah. Um, yeast. Now, the type of yeast you use for your beers with temp control varies as well, yeah? So there's lager yep. yeast and there's ale yeast and all that sort of stuff. But, so. Yeah. Generally speaking, you've got two two family. This is simplifying things, but you got your lager yeasts, which like to ferment cooler, and then you got ale yeasts, which you usually ferment warmer. Now you've got variation in ale yeasts and lager yeasts, but yeah, if you if you're brewing a lager, you temperature ranges from the, in the low end about eight degrees up to fourteen degrees, and the ale sweet spots usually sort of. 17 degrees to 22 um and the the big thing about that is it doesn't matter if you're at the higher end or the lower end really but you just want to try and be consistent it's much better to be a little bit above that range and have a consistent temperature rather than swinging from a little bit too hot to a little bit too That's cold issues. yeah it's the... yeah yeah That's really good. and then you've got we were talking about like the Saison, like this one, I fermented this at 28 degrees because I wanted to try and push the phenols and uh, the esters that the yeast creates. And you've got the special use case um, uh, yeast like the Kvike yeasts, um, which we've got Voss at the shop, um, which I've, I've, brewed, I've brewed up at 40 degrees, but that's a special use case yeast. But generally speaking, 8 to, eight to 14 for a lager and sort of 17 to 22 for an ale. That's... That's the simplified version. But if yeah. you look at the back of the yeast pack, they'll always have a, a recommended range for their optimum performance. You can always add chilled water to your wort um, when you're first making your beer so that the initial temperature of your beer when you're adding your yeast isn't too high. Um, yeah, this, so it's, a, it's a real struggle that we have in Australia and Newcastle being a little bit more tropical climate, like you see the American and uh, European users, they've got, groundwater that's 10 degrees or eight degrees and like i don't know about you but in, in summer my groundwater's 25 27 yeah, exactly. degrees yeah, yeah. and it's it's really hard but yeah that forward planning of putting like about six liters in the fridge so they're nice and cold some people even will make an ice brick out of like yeah. a couple of liters of ice and put that in initially just to try and get that temperature down but yeah. that requires a little bit more planning as well because if you do put your yeast in when it's too hot, you'll kill it. Put it in, it's too cold, it won't do anything. It'll just right. lay there like a fat kid on a cupcake and, and do nothing. Yeah, you, you can put it in too cold and then deliberately slowly bring the beer up. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's of the two options. You, 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 yeah, you're better off to go on the cooler end rather than to kill it. <laughs> or it'll just take off and it'll go through the roof and you'll have beer coming out of the airlock, shit everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine a fat kid smacking down a whole box of donuts from that donut shop at the airport and they sit there and they go, oh, what have I done? That's what you used to do in your beer and it tastes like. Yeah. 18 to 22 degrees or 12 to 15 degrees for lagers. Keep it yeah. simple and just enjoy your beers. We talked about dry hops, whether it's at the start of the fermentation uh, or the, should I add the additional hops at the beginning of the brew or at a later stage? Uh, so brew, I assume you mean fermentation, if you're doing an extract brew. Um, that's largely down to the recipe. You can do either. You'll get a slightly different result. Um, I would usually recommend adding in uh, a dry hop around sort of day three or day four of fermentation. You want to get it ideally about five, to 10 points before the end of fermentation enough to keep that hops in suspension as the yeast is moving uh, the wort around but not so much that it scrubs out all the delicious flavors and aromas that you want in your beer and you end up with a really nice smelling fermentation chamber but not a very nice smelling beer um so gen generally day four or so uh, moving right along to brew father so yep. brew father 
is the app or program that we use in the shop. Um, it's about 20 bucks a year to subscribe to it. It's really easy to use. Extract brewers can use it. Grainies can use it. There's heaps of different recipes on there. I was just flicking through then again. There's there's meads, there's fruit beers, there's Dubels, there's Belgian ales, there's pals. They're all on there. Um, it, it's an app that it can be used to create your own recipes. Um, I also have it on my phone so I can use it to control my grandfather. Um, if I want to use my grandfather in manual mode, um, I simply bring up my recipe with my phone. I don't have it here, but I'll simply bring up my recipe and go to batch, press play, and it starts the sequence of events so I know when to add my hops, um, what my mass temperature is. Thank you. Um, it's all in here on Brew Father. So don't be scared of it. Um, it's also just for us in the shop. It's our preferred way to get um, your your grain brews done, um, your grain orders. So you can actually cre either create a brew or find a brew in there that you want, export it, email it to us at the shop as a PDF, and we can prepare your brew for you as long as you give us a little bit of notice. There you go, there on your screen. So if you press the play button there now, um, it's going to run through what he needs to do to create his beer, flip off alarms, um, and Sorry. the world is your oyster. So we're looking at my screen now. I'll share your screen and all sorts of stuff. So, <clears throat> so as Stu said, this is Brewfather. It's a web-based app. Uh, I used to use Beersmith, uh, but it was it was a really great program. But this one is built on the cloud, and that means that it automatically syncs um, no matter what device I'm using. So I really like that. Uh, since then, Beersmith has come out with a similar sort of thing. But anyway, we're not talking about that. So when you open it up, it looks really complicated. You've got your recipes. These are all my personal recipes that I've been doing. The batches is every time you brew a beer, it's a batch of a recipe. So you can have a recipe with several batches of the same recipe, and you might tweak each batch of the same base recipe or have different changes whatever you like um devices is any um uh, connected devices i've got a tilt in here um inventory you can track what stuff you've got on hand like yeasts and hops and things the library is public um uh public uh recipes for beers as you can see there's heaps of different stuff if you're searching for a beer the best place to start with is if you want to say i don't know crankshaft for example um you get a couple of different ones obviously i use the number of downloads and views and thumbs up to see which ones are better or worse um and of course uh, when you select a recipe you want to make sure that you scale a recipe to your system so i might just do that arbitrarily yeah. um i'll deliberately find one that's not for my system so this one here it's a 46 liter batch you click on it and then I'm going to copy that to my local library. So if I go to my recipes and look for, here we go, it's just here. So you can see here, um, let's have a look at the equipment. So the equipment is telling Brewfather what system you're using to brew. Now, if you're an extract brewer, it could be as simple as I use a 30 liter fermenter and I'm just using extract. So you just set your maximum volume of your fermenter. Uh, and I've got, I've got a, a profile for that down here uh, called extract. So a 23 liter batch. Um, but anyway, so you can see under the equipment, you've got the batch volume is 50 liters. I don't want to do a 50 liter batch. I want to do it on my standard 23 liter batch in my g40 so the way that i do that as i go up to here change equipment profile and then i'm going to select grandfather g40 10 amp no jacket with a 35 liter hlt select that and click save and it's going to ask me do you want to scale the recipe make changes to the recipe so that's the same beer at the smaller volume and you can see down here 
it was 12 kilos, 650 grams and 300 grams. If I hit yes, that is now adjusted that. And you would have seen in the background all of these sort of pretty graphics flying around. This is basically like its estimated ABV is sitting here at 6.2%. Its original gravity, estimated original gravity is sitting here at 1056. And the final gravity is at 1009. The color in EBC is 13, the IBUs is 41, and the bitterness to gravity, bitter, bittering units to gravity units ratio is sitting at 0 0.73. Now, if you're sitting there going, what the hell is that? Don't worry about that. These are all, the green areas are pulled from the style guide. So you can see the style is an American IPA and anywhere within this range, it would be suitable to be called an American IPA. So if you're designing a recipe, it's really handy to know what sort of um, uh, what sort of recipe you're aiming for, and you can use Brew Father to see if you're within that kind of ballpark. It's not going to tell you if it tastes any good, but at least on on paper, it's it's of the style of that. So that's that's how to sort of um, get a, a, a recipe into your system, and just having a look over it. Uh, tells you an awful lot about the beer. You can see here, I won't get into water adjustments, but you want to set your water. If you're thinking about water chemistry, it's probably better to do a separate video because it can be a bit of a, a deep dive down a rabbit hole. But no, you're talking... Really, just add Campton tablets, knock out the chlorine. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about different ways that you can um, send a recipe to us. You, it, when you click on, uh, if, if you wanted to print uh, this recipe, um, it will come up, it saves it, you can see here it saves as a PDF. And then we'll wait for that to load. And so here you can see, it allows us to see exactly how much of what different types of uh, grain you want and where all the hops are. And we'll, we will bag it up based on the recipe, if you would like. Um, so, and just attach this to an email. It's the easiest way. We have some people who will take screenshots and we'll get sort of three screenshots. We have to sort of play jigsaw puzzles. It just makes it overly complicated. Yeah. Um, it's just much easier to, to attach a, a PDF. You can also um, export or, or share a recipe and copy that if you like, but it has to be a public recipe. And the other way you can do it is if you go to brew and then you can print a shopping list if you like, and this will just give you the total amounts of ingredients that you need. So you can see that it's grouped all of the hops together. And if you wanted to save a, a bit of money, um, you could do it this way, but then you would have to weigh each addition out. Um, so it's a little bit cheaper to buy the hops, uh, but you, it's a bit more, bit more work for you on the other end. But that's that's another way you can do it. Same thing makes it easy for us and easy for you as well. The other thing I wanted to uh, talk about is coming up with with recipes based on commercial ones. Uh, I recently drank this beer here, Deeds Draft. I had just something that's not hoppy. Um, and I wanted to say, okay, well, let's try and brew a beer um, based on based on the information that breweries give you. Now, they don't give you the whole recipe, but you can kind of extrapolate and get sort of close. Um, so you see here it says it's a bright, clean, refreshing lager made with 20% maize, adding a balance of creaminess to crisp finish, hopped with mandarin of Bavaria, evoking a slight notes of mandarin and oranges. The style is lager. And the hops is Mandarin Bavaria and Warrior, and the and the malt is pale malt and maize. ABV is four point two percent. So it doesn't give you much, but it actually gives you enough to get pretty close. So what I've done, I know that um, it's uh, pale malt and maize. So I've just did this ahead of time. So first things first, when you're doing a um, a recipe, set your uh, equipment up so that you know, so that uh, Brewfather can accurately sort of guess where you're heading. Um, I also set my style just so I know roughly the range that I'm looking at. 
because it doesn't give me my bitterness. I know what hops are used, uh, but not the bitterness range. So what I did, I added Pilsner malt and I added maize. And then I went into the percent sign and I set it to 80% pale and 20% maize because that's what they said on the can. And then I all I did is I adjusted my OG, my original gravity, so that my final ABV, which is, uh, where is it? There we go. Final ABV here is 4.3%. So that's roughly what the um, the beer was because 4.2. So I'm, I'm okay there. And I knew the brewery would have done a, probably done a whirlpool to get that flavor from the Mandarina Bavaria. So I did a two grams per liter, just as a guess. Uh, it's It was based on the t flavor of the beer. It had a bit of hop flavor, but not too much. So I did an aroma stand there and then i knew that the other hop there was warrior it's a really common and great bittering hop um and then i just went in and uh, I'll, I'll show you what, how i did that i'll just remove that just so you can see what i mean so my ibus here without that warrior edition was sitting at 26 ibu and with an international pilsner style the upper range is 40 the lower range is 17. Now, I think that it was a probably moderately, it wasn't heavily bittered. So I wanted to be sort of in that 30. I, I probably need to change this a little bit more. But so, oopsie daisy. So I went to add the warrior. And then as you click up, one gram at 60 minute boil will give me an approximate amount of 1.8 IBUs. So I'm, I'm aiming for about four or five IBUs with this edition. So I'm just going to keep hitting up until I get the five IBUs here, which is three grams, and that's it. And then you. The IBU use... is international bittering units for all the new guys. Correct. It's the bitterness you're going to get out of your beer from the hops. Obviously, yeah. when you put hops in hot water, it releases more bitterness, so you'll get a more bitter beer as opposed to dry hopping, where you get more flavour and aroma. Mm -hmm. so just and, for the new guys just to clarify a little bit there. yeah and a lot of people see this as like too much info they just like to throw the kit together and just make a beer or follow a recipe and there's nothing wrong with that but two reasons uh that it's worth taking notes and and uh, tracking these things number one is if you have any issues or questions it's really useful for people trying to help you um to to know exactly what you've done so we can try and diagnose the issue um, and also if you're try, starting to try and make your own recipes um, you all have a flavor preference and you might you know you might find that you like beers on the less bitter side or the more bitter side or and just sort of seeing where the, the beers that you've made that you really like sort of investigate the, uh, the stats of the beer if you like and sort of start to build the the sort of beers that you like to brew because i mean that's that's the ultimate idea of this hobby right like if you're making beers that you don't like to drink then you're doing it wrong um and it doesn't really matter what other people think um because it's your beer and, and you made it and that's that's a beautiful thing right so well, yeah that's what it's all about yeah yeah uh, don't worry about what anybody else thinks if you're happy good as go that's right so for the newer okay. guys if, if you if you punched in there in the search criteria extracts it'll bring up a hyper extract um extract brews that you can do oh, yeah. um, using um the brew father app so and don't be so, scared mm, yep go ahead the, the cooper's yeah. kits are in there there you go um Black I, Rock? I, I don't know that Blackrock is. Let me, while you keep talking, I'll just have a it's the recipe there that had Blackrock in it. It might be in there. But anyway, all your your light malts and your wheat malts. Yeah, Blackrock is too. Extras. Yeah, there you go. Blackrock's in there. So don't More be scared just... of using it. And for twenty bucks a year, it's just one of those things that just makes life that much easier. Males ask us another question. I've seen some brewers using hops powder. Lupulin instead of, or as well as actual hops pellets. It's a good idea. Yeah. 
I've never used. I've never used. I've, yeah, I've used. used I've used cryo hops, yes. Um, so the hop powder, it's there's um, Lupulo, Lup, Lupulo Max, Lupamax. Is the, Lupamax, that's right. That's the HPA product. And the other one, which is the same product with a different name, is cryo hops. Um, basically, it's the leftover lupulin gland, which is the yellow stuff in the hop cones, that out of processing, they get a lot of dust. Um, of the lupulin glands is falling into the machinery and they used to just have that as waste. Now what they do is they cryo freeze the hot matter to make them really brittle and deliberately try and extract the, the oh, sorry, uh, I might be getting the process a little bit wrong, but basically it's concentrated lupulin um, matter with less vegetal matter. So essentially it's like you're using half the amount of, half the weight of hops to get the same amount of lupulin the, the, yeah. the chemicals yeah. from the hops in the beer. So it, it that does have a slightly different flavour. I wouldn't use all cryo because there, there's um, um, reports saying that it can negatively impact the beer if you're using all um, cryo, but having a mixture of of normal T90 pellets and cryo um, is, is a good option. And I've used that when heavily dry hop beers just so I don't get so much loss in my fermenter. So I was able to cut down the amount of hops in the beer by about 100, 150 grams. There's a few things. The new Apollo comes with a 10 pound and a 15 pound rated pressure relief valve. So anything above that, it'll, it'll blow off. Um, there's the old uh, brass. Um, valve that keg king used to do that you screw into your disconnect um and there's the new spundit valve now i have a spundit valve downstairs i use it i really really like it it's really super super accurate and it's got a little vial off to the side that acts like an airlock and it just shows you what's happening um and what's going on with your with your pressure fermenting so if you can hang off for the spundit valve um and they're not in stock at the moment. They're still over in the States. They're actually handmade by a guy in the States. Um, yeah. They're about 120 bucks, I think, at the moment. They're pretty hexy. But they are really, really good at them if you're keen to do some pressure fermenting. Do you want to add anything to pressure fermenting, mate, while we're here? Um, yeah, I have. I use a, a duo-type spunding valve uh, at home. Um, it, it's a, just a way of controlling the amount of pressure um and for me it's not so much about lots of people talk about you know you can brew it faster uh, at higher temperatures and it suppresses the esters which is true um but you can get the similar results by pitching proper yeast proper healthy yeast and controlling your temperatures um and you, you get a a good fast fermentation you shouldn't be more than sort of five six days um without pressure anyway unless you're doing a big imperial stout the big one is just uh, being able to uh, let the pressure build at the end of fermentation and then when you crash chilling, it's not sucking in oxygen and you can um, do a full closed system oxygen-free transfer into the keg. For me, that's been a big game changer. Not worried about bugs or dust or anything getting in. It's a bit of a faff to get everything ready, but once it's in, just click, click, disconnects on, closed system, you can nearly walk away. I have the keg on the set of scales. And you can see the condensation coming up the keg as yeah. well. It's just so easy. They are. They're a good bit of kit. They yeah. really are. At the end of February, apparently, we're doing some <laughs> workshop based. <laughs> I've just learned this myself. Um, so keep an eye out on Facebook. Um, join up to the newsletter and you'll get some info. Well, I do have you here. The old stamp cards that we had in store, the old coffee card. Uh, end of uh, end of January, which is pretty soon. Corn, corn. corn. No more after a stamp card. You need to give us all your details, um, and it's going to become an electronic system, so that when you do order online, people will get some points they can put towards gear and, and what have you, just to make a bit of a, a fairer system for us um, and yeah. all your fantastic customers. So thank you all for your all your support been awesome um and keep an eye out for all the new guys there extract brewing basics end of feb i'm also looking at trying to do some more classes with smoking hot and saucy 
so we can learn to brew beer and smoke brisket and eat till we're really fat um, all in one day. I think it's about a four-hour thing. So they'll be happening out at Broke hopefully later on in the year as soon as all this COVID crap gets sorted out. But, the food is off tap. The beer's pretty good too. Yeah, the beer's not bad, but the food is it's good. Publication. I like it. <laughs> I don't think so. Nope. We, we were going to talk about carbonation, but we might leave that for next time, eh? We can leave it for next time. Look, one carb drop to a stubby, two carb drops to a long neck. Don't try and put in more sugar or dextrose to get more alcohol. You won't get any more alcohol. You're just going to wear a freaking glass bottle through the ceiling. Yeah, it doesn't work. Good. Just keep it simple. Do what you're told. And everything will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jimmy Denning. I know who the boss is. <laughs> and the hats will be available in store when I put them in the back of my van and take them into the shop. Woo! Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy no worries. your weekend and um, see you next time. Cheers. See you guys. Bye.